These deserted buildings on an island in San Francisco Bay hold the memories of men who were young during World War II and who were our enemies. They were prisoners here, Japanese sailors whose submarines were sunk in the Solomon Islands. German soldiers captured in Egypt. Nazi generals taken prisoner in the desert battles of Tunisia. Italians who gave up in Europe and Africa. Japanese soldiers who surrendered at Guadalcanal. And the man with perhaps the strangest story of all, the very first captive of the war. This was America's prisoner of war camp on Angel Island. And the war was over for the men who were held behind the barbed wire here. And yet they were surrounded by the boom and the bustle of wartime cities jammed while America's living the most dramatic decade of our century. I'm Russ Conlon, inviting you to return to that time when we found ourselves saving things that we'd always thrown away, unable to get things we'd always taken for granted, growing things in vacant lots that hadn't seen a spade or a hoe since the days of the Spanish missions, and finding new heroes to cheer. Termites. And new villains to hiss at the neighborhood movie. OK, you Yankee doodle dandy, come and get it. A time when we were part of wartime's darkest secret and celebrated history's greatest victory. On December 7, 1941, while Japanese planes were attacking Pearl Harbor, the prisoner of war camp was being activated here on Angel Island. And, appropriately, our first captive of the war was brought here. He was Kajuo Sakamaki, a 23-year-old Japanese Navy ensign, the commander of a two-man submarine. His was to be a suicide mission, sneaking into Pearl Harbor and sinking American warships at anchor. Sakamaki says that he imagined a glorious and heroic death. But he missed the harbor entrance, repeatedly rammed his sub into a coral reef, eventually got lost, and finally tried to scuttle his craft. An unconscious Sakamaki was washed up on a beach outside Honolulu. So was his midget submarine. The Army sergeant who captured him was a Japanese-American. And that's how Kazuo Sakamaki came to be here, as America's first combat prisoner of war. It'd be a long time before any of his fellow countrymen would follow him because for much of that first wartime year, we were losing in the Pacific. Troops were pouring across the embarkation docks headed for island destinations we had never heard of. But now, some were coming back too, wounded, and often with jungle diseases that American medics weren't really prepared for. Ships were being launched at an astonishing rate in San Francisco, Sausalito, Oakland, Vallejo, and Richmond. It was not unusual for one ship to still be sliding down the ways while the keel for the next one was being swung into place. But now, some ships were returning, scarred, battered, often streaked with blood. There were losses on the Bay Area home front, too. The most mysterious had its beginning here at Muffet Field outside Sunnyvale. On a summer day in 1942, a Navy blimp took off on a routine anti-submarine patrol, and the crew vanished. The blimp itself returned. It crash-landed at 432 Bellevue Avenue in Daly City. All parachutes and the rubber life raft were intact. The radio was working. There was no sign of trouble or attack. The Navy was mystified. The fate of the blimp's two-officer crew is a tantalizing puzzle that has never been solved. Air raid drills were a familiar part of civilian life all along the coast. Every home was supposed to have blackout curtains, as well as a bucket of sand to take care of incendiaries. Well, some people took all of this a bit more seriously than others. Menlo Park, California. Mr. Frank Terramore shows the absolute ultimate in home air raid precautions. Special blackout shutters. Complete first aid equipment, of course. And a one man and one boy fire brigade. Special catwalks have been built on the Terramorse roof. 
and there's regular practice against the latest bombs, the phosphorus calling card incendiaries. And let the whole Axis know, Mr. Terramorse is prepared to blitz the blitz. The only Japanese bombs to actually land on the American mainland during the war were floated across the ocean from Japan on balloons. The idea was that these were supposed to start large forest fires in the western United States. About one bomb in 50 is loaded with an explosive charge. This charge will fire at the end of one minute. Therefore, do not approach this bomb until one minute has passed. How many of those incendiaries made it to the United States or actually caused some damage is unknown. But by the spring of 1942, it was obvious that there would be no quick victories. We were in for a long, tough war. The draft was extended. Men from 45 to 65 years old were signed up, not for combat, but for home front conscription if need be. By fall, we were running out of things too. Coffee, sugar, canned goods, shoes, meat, gasoline, heating oil, all were in short supply. In November, rationing became law. Boards were set up to decide who got how much or what. And rationing stamps were required with each purchase. There were great patriotic appeals against hoarding or cheating, but of course, there were the war profiteers and the cheaters, including some members of the United States Congress. Every kind of metal was in short supply, so everyone was encouraged to save tin cans and turn in anything else that might conceivably be melted down for tanks and guns and bullets. Of course, no cars were being made, so anything that could still sputter onto the street was pressed into service. To save gas and tires, a nationwide speed limit was legislated. 35 miles per hour. The rubber shortage inspired at least one man to reinvent the wheel. But wooden tires never really caught on. Farm labor was brought up from Mexico. The first braceros to replace field hands who were in the service and all those Japanese American farmers who had been sent to relocation camps. Urban amateurs also made a valiant try at growing things. Victory Gardens sprouted from Berkeley window boxes, the rooftops of Oakland apartments, and vacant lots on Knob Hill and Pacific Heights. A few young Sharpies got ducked out in zoot suits. Unfortunately, this L.A. fashion statement never got a firm hold in San Francisco, and it was ultimately doomed by the shortage of cloth. So were ordinary suits for men, or what we had thought of as ordinary into Len. Vests had vanished, pants no longer had cuffs, and. Those high-waisted trousers and baggy coats were out, too. Nylon and silk were needed for parachutes and powder bags. So stockings disappeared from the market, and women were encouraged to turn in their nylons for the war effort. The city of Paris, J. Magnans, and the White House were showing styles with a kind of combat aggressiveness. This one was apparently designed for takeoff into the wild blue yonder, and perhaps it did, because now, what had traditionally been seen as the woman's role had undergone a radical change. Today's beauty contests are in the shipyards, on the assembly lines. Here at Marin Ship, California, women welders have a lunchtime contest. Men workers vote on each girl's appearance, job record, and attendance. For now, Miss America is at work. Soon, men weren't the only ones in the armed forces. A heavy recruiting program was underway for wax waves, spars, women marines, and for women pilots to ferry combat planes to the war zones overseas. Young West Coast Japanese Americans who had been deprived of most of their rights, most of their property, and all of their freedom when they were hauled off to internment camps began signing up for the Army. Before it was over, 33,000 Nisei had enlisted. It was an incredible scenario. Soldiers on their way to battlefields overseas, while their parents, wives, and children remain behind barbed wire in America. Stars and celebrities were enlisting. Among them, the sports superstar from San Francisco, Joe DiMaggio. Jolting Joe gave up his draft deferment and a $50,000 a year salary to become just G.I. Joe. Another volunteer named Joe, the heavyweight champion of the world. Joe Lewis knocked out Buddy Bear, donated his end of the gate to Navy relief, and joined the army. Joe said, God is on our side. And all I was made of that. But we didn't talk much about this fact. The armed forces were segregated and would remain that way well beyond the war. 
Blacks were routinely assigned to kitchens and motor pools. There was, to be sure, a black general. And there was an all-black Air Corps pursuit squadron whose officers were prohibited from entering white officers' clubs. Almost all of the one million blacks in uniform were in a Jim Crow army commanded by white officers. Even the blood to be used for transfusions was segregated into vials labeled white or colored. Before the war was a year old, wartime industry was bringing a new kind of social experience to both blacks and whites here in the Bay Area. Ads had been running in newspapers all over the country, particularly in the South, which had the nation's largest pool of unemployed, imploring workers to come to the West Coast. Black workers answered these ads by the tens of thousands. The recruiters had made an implicit promise. In California, you'll find new beginnings and equality. That wasn't a promise that would be fully kept. But for most, life was better here than it was there. Now, many settled adjacent to San Francisco shipyards at Hunter's Point in, well, what was supposed to be temporary housing. And others went to Oakland, Vallejo, Richmond, the newly built Marin City, and a section of San Francisco that was known as the Fillmore. <laughs> There was already a middle-class black community here, but now, with newcomers crowding in, this became black America's main street on the West Coast, the Lenox Avenue of San Francisco. Suddenly, it was a bustling enclave with a new flash in its style, a new swagger in its walk, and a taste for musicians who were already legendary. The new flood of black workers was a bit of a shock to many San Franciscans. There was even alarm in the East Bay, which had a larger, well-established black population, many of them railroad employees. San Francisco Mayor Angela Rossi very nearly panicked. He talked of the Negro invasion. But cooler heads, both white and black, prevailed. For the duration of the war, the Bay Area settled into a tentative and kind of mutually fascinated truce between black people new to California and Californians new to the idea of lots of neighbors who were black. And meanwhile, another change had come to Fillmore Street. The fancy ironwork arches that had crowned every intersection since the 1915 World's Fair were torn down. It was part of the scrap metal drive for the war effort going on all over America. Old timers decried it as the symbolic end of an era, and it was. But they also conceded that if the Smithsonian Institution could contribute its entire collection of guns and tanks from World War I, then the arches over Fillmore Street were a small sacrifice indeed. There would be many bigger wartime changes in store for the Bay Area in the days ahead. Summer, 1942. Suddenly, the tide of battle turned in favor of the Allies. First, off Midway Island in the Pacific, in five minutes that changed history, American torpedo bombers reduced four Japanese carriers and many other ships to flaming wrecks headed for the bottom with 3,000 men aboard. Then, American troops landed on Guadalcanal, the first of a whole series of Japanese-held islands that would be turned into bloody stepping stones toward Tokyo. Meanwhile, the Soviets turned the Germans back at Stalingrad. During two years of incredible sacrifice, would drive Hitler's troops from Russia and the Balkans. The Americans and British invaded Nazi strongholds in North Africa. And next would come the hard-fought invasion of Italy. Eventually, d -Day, the Allied invasion of a European continent that the Nazis had turned into a fortress. The beginning of the long, long march to Berlin. You didn't see scenes like this in the newsreels. There were never pictures of American bodies or a graveyard on a lonely Pacific island or the coffins that were unloaded along the San Francisco waterfront. What you did see were stories of heroes. And even in those stories, the human sacrifice was obvious. A lean, tough sea fighter limps home after scoring one of the greatest naval triumphs in history. Wearing proud scars, the U.S. cruiser San Francisco noses to her base. Off the Solomon, she crushed a Jap battleship and two cruisers in an epic sea fight. 
And now honors. San Francisco's Mayor Rossi greets the brave crew. All America salutes these officers and men who wrote history in the waters of the Pacific. We got plenty of fictional heroes too. And they're almost as popular as the villains that we love to hate at the neighborhood movie. Hollywood sent us an endless array of heroic fighting men. Handsome, lovable, reckless, resolute, clear-eyed, and naturally, chock full of red, white, and blue-blooded American bravery. Their Nazi adversaries, on the other hand, were brutal, strutting braggarts. They spent a lot of time slapping around helpless people and talking about the master race. These Hollywood Huns did have one advantage over their Japanese counterparts, however. They could also be ridiculous. Heil Hitler! 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 Heil myself. Japanese villains were never funny. They were uniformly sly and evil, thinking of bestial tortures and ingenious new schemes for world domination. But they did help with minority hiring. Every one of those villainous roles was actually played by a Chinese American. We will win this war because we are willing to sacrifice 10 million lives. The Market Street movie palaces ran day and night. For your 45 cents, you got a movie, a cartoon, a newsreel, and a full stage show, often starring one of the big swing bands. Band leaders like Jimmy Dorsey, Artie Shaw, and Woody Herman were the idols of young America. And at least one, Glenn Miller, who had joined the Air Corps, became the sentimental musical symbol for a generation. New York, L.A., and San Francisco each had a stage door canteen, and that was a place where ordinary GIs could mix with famous stars. And ours was here on Mason Street. All kinds of performers, from classical sopranos at the Opera House to Shakespearean actors working the legit theaters of Geary Street to song and dance men like Ray Bolger came to entertain the troops. Of course, there was always a band, often one as famous as Benny Goodman's with that young singer he was featuring, Peggy Lee. Since at least the Spanish-American War, San Francisco had been known as one of the world's great liberty towns. But now it was being stretched beyond the limits. The big YMCA on the Embarcadero was jammed every night, and so was every other Y, USO, and public facility in the whole area. Servicemen spent the night in luxury hotels, the Mark, the St. Francis, the Drake, the Fairmont, the Palace, not in rooms, but on lobby couches. We had run out of space. By now, not only had this become the world's greatest shipbuilding complex, it was among America's most crucial cargo ports. At one point, more military supplies cleared the Golden Gate than all other United States ports combined. Moving cargo at that volume, constructing ships at that speed, and with many inexperienced people on the job, there would be the inevitable accidents. When a foreign armed fire swept through a pier at the San Francisco Navy Yard, warehouses filled with ammunition and combat supplies were threatened. But hundreds of volunteers rushed to the scene, and for four hours, while the flames raged out of control, they moved that cargo piece by piece and saved it all. The only casualties were from smoke inhalation, no fatalities. But 30 miles north, in the town of Port Chicago, a summer night, 1944, turned into a nightmare. The Bay Area's greatest single home front tragedy of the war. The explosion of two munition ships in San Francisco Bay shocks the world. The earth-shaking explosion happened at night, killing 321 persons. Amazingly enough, bombs still rest in an ammunition train near the dock. Huge pieces of jagged metal were blown for miles. In the town of Port Chicago, not one building left undamaged. The strange and terrifying explosion, which injured at least a thousand, will probably never be solved, for only small pieces of the ships remain. The shipyards were now adapting ships to be turned over to China. 
which had never really had a merchant marine before. The Bay Area, of course, had a closer kinship with China than did any other region of America. Every family in San Francisco's Chinatown had relatives and friends who had fallen victim to the Japanese war machine in Asia. Nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek was a powerful symbol here, but it was his bright and glamorous wife, Madame Chiang, who made the greatest impression on the city, and then on the nation. Meanwhile, at Stanford and here at UC Berkeley, new kinds of training programs were underway. Administrators were being prepared for running the military governments of occupied countries, and there were some facts to justify that kind of optimism. American, British, and Canadian forces had fought right up to one border of the Nazi fatherland, while the Russians were driving hard toward the other, taking thousands of German prisoners as they went. In the Pacific, we had taken Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Then came the fierce battles of the Philippines the blood-soaked invasion of Iwo Jima with its mid-battle flag-raising, the most famous combat photo of all time, taken by a San Francisco photographer, Joe Rosenthal. Early in 1945, MacArthur made good his pledge to return to the Philippines. After vicious street-by-street, block-by-block fighting virtually leveled the capital, Manila was free. And so were the survivors of the Bataan Death March, those who still lived after years of starvation, disease, and brutality. San Francisco, back from three years of living hell in Bataan's Cabana Juan prison, come nearly 300 army heroes. Good news of victories everywhere, as the long journey home ends this side of the Golden Gate. Men who lasted out the march of death in the Philippines now march back to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Homecoming for men who remember Corregidor. The memories would be somewhat different for Axis troops who were our prisoners. There were 425,000 of them here in the United States and scattered in camps all across the country. Some were still here on Angel Island, Italians mostly and some Germans, getting the same food and medical care as American GIs. Very few Japanese came through here. Many apparently preferred death to surrender. An exception, that first prisoner whose luck ran out on the very day that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Kazuo Sakamaki was sent from Angel Island to various other prison camps in America, and after the war, he was repatriated. He wrote a book about his experiences. He went to work for Toyota. He tried to introduce the first Toyota cars to the United States and failed. But he was successful in South America. A few years ago, he retired, the well-to-do president of Toyota of Brazil. By early spring of 1945, we were on the very edge of victory in Europe. But along the way, we would lose the man who had been the symbol of our wartime purpose. We are going to win this war, and we are going to win the peace that follows. It was April 1945, Friday the 13th. If Franklin Roosevelt had lived just another 12 days, he would have seen his fondest vision move toward reality in San Francisco. San Francisco, stage for the grand opening of the United Nations Conference. And from the skyways of the world come the delegates of 46 countries traveling across the world that together they may find the road to international justice. This was Roosevelt's dream proposed at an Atlantic Charter meeting five years before. In late April of 1945, with the world still at war, it was happening. The eyes of all mankind focus on San Francisco, scene of one of the most significant and decisive meetings in human history. From 47 United Nations come the men and women who carry with them the hope of the world's two billion people for lasting peace. Not since the first wild days of the gold rush, and perhaps never again in history, would there be such intense worldwide interest centered on this city. And behind the scenes, over 1,000 of the world's best reporters, almost a million words flow daily out of San Francisco. Through press, screen, and radio, the people of nearly every land will be told more about this meeting than any other event that has ever transpired. The world awaits the discussion, the amendments, and compromises of San Francisco. Here, truth, cooperation, and understanding can build a mighty structure, a golden gate to lasting peace.
If human actions have not quite lived up to the United Nations humanitarian ideal, it was not for a lack of noble thoughts, brave words, and the great hopes that were expressed here by the Golden Gate that spring. With the signing of the UN Charter in San Francisco that June by 50 nations, the International Forum became a reality. Well before that, while the delegates were still gathering in San Francisco, great historic events were happening with lightning speed in Europe. Look at what happened within a two-week period. April 25th, Russian and American troops meet up at the Elba River, cutting German forces in half. April 28th, Mussolini tries to sneak out of Italy. He is caught and killed by Italian partisans. April 29th, Russian troops fight house to house toward the center of Berlin, and American and British bombers continue pounding the city from the air. April 30th, Hitler and his mistress, Eva Braun, commit suicide. May 2nd. The city of Berlin gives up. May 7th, the Germans surrender. The war in Europe is over. In May of 1945, the new order, which was to have lasted for a thousand years, vanished from living history. On the West Coast, fresh troops, including rested and retrained veterans from Europe, start on the last lap into the complex fighting in the vastness of the Pacific. On to final victory over Japan. Before they could come marching home, a lot more blood would flow and much of it would be American. We weren't saying it. We certainly weren't singing it. But we were thinking it in May of 1945. By now, most Japanese generals and admirals knew their war was lost. But Japan was still in the grip of military fanatics to whom death was a reasonable alternative to defeat. We knew that any landing on the Japanese islands would be met by human waves of sacrificial troops. It appeared that even greater bloodshed lay ahead, and we dreaded it, the invasion of Japan. But a super secret project had long been underway. And inside this closely guarded building in Berkeley, the atom had been split. Uranium-235 was produced. That was the heart of the most destructive force ever known. And ironically, it was that force of destruction that was about to bring a dramatic conclusion to the war. With an almost unknown part of the high-risk drama to be played out right here in the Bay Area. Three weeks before Pearl Harbor, construction of the cyclotron had been given A1A priority by the government. The reason was put under deep cover. The cyclotron's inventor, young professor Ernest O. Lawrence, had a theory that one product could be explosive energy from uranium. He had a brilliant team of youthful scientists working out of the UC Radiation Laboratory, the Rad Lab boys, they were called. And they and the university were assigned management of the biggest secret and the biggest gamble of World War II. Codename, Manhattan Project. Three hidden cities were built in remote parts of the country. Hanford, Washington, Alamogordos, New Mexico, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Tens of thousands of workers were hired, most of whom had no idea what they were working on. And even some managers were skeptical. Tremendous quantities of materials were going into the plants and nothing was coming out. They didn't know that they were in a desperate race with the Nazis who were also on the way to developing uranium fission. They had a big head start. With Germany's defeat, America won that one. But the invasion of Japan was still a looming reality. Early in 1945, components of an atom bomb that included 200 pounds of deadly uranium were flown from New Mexico to this air base in Marin County, Hamilton Air Force Base. The scientists who made it weren't even sure what it would take to set it off. There hadn't been any atomic testing yet. Somehow, they moved it from Hamilton to Hunter's Point in San Francisco. Well, how that was done isn't clear. They may have trucked it across the Golden Gate Bridge and through the city. At Hunter's Point, it was loaded aboard the heavy cruiser Indianapolis. And on July 15th at 8 a.m., the cruiser and the A-bomb sailed out through the Golden Gate, headed for the island of Tinian. At exactly the same time on that same day, one of the Rad Lab boys, J. Robert Oppenheimer, stood on the desert in New Mexico overseeing final preparations for the first atomic test. Early the next morning, the device was positioned on a tower at Los Alamos, and the countdown began. Oppenheimer's colleague from UC, physicist Owen Chamberlain, 
bet five dollars that it would not work. He lost. President Truman, meeting at Potsdam with Churchill and Stalin, was advised of the successful test. He told our allies, and an immediate broadcast was made to Japan. It called for unconditional surrender and warned that we were armed with a weapon of devastating power. There was no answer. Two and a half weeks later, American planes showered Hiroshima with leaflets. Your city will be obliterated unless your government surrendered, it said. Still, no answer. Two days later, President Truman sent word to Tinian Island, drop it. The bomb was loaded aboard a B-29 and the navigator set a course for Hiroshima. At 8.15, on the morning of August 6, 1945, the bomb bay doors opened. One minute later, the world entered into the age of atomic warfare. Now, President Truman himself spoke directly to the Japanese people. That attack is only a warning of things to come. If Japan does not surrender, bombs will have to be dropped on war industries. And unfortunately, thousands of civilian lives will be lost. I urge Japanese civilians to leave industrial cities immediately and save themselves from destruction. For three days, the Japanese cabinet was deadlocked over whether or not to surrender. The military was still insisting on one great last battle on the home islands. Japan didn't know it then, but America had only one more atomic bomb. August 9th, it was dropped on Nagasaki. 7 p.m. Eastern Wartime, Bob Schott reporting. The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. This is it. The Second World War, which embroiled 56 nations and 85 million men, is ended. San Francisco, blacked out and constantly alerted against Jap treachery, uncorks the pent-up emotions of almost four years. Market Street is a madhouse, but who cares on B.J. Day? But as the celebration wore on into a second night, those pent-up emotions overflowed into drunken destruction. As reporter Stan Delaplane wrote in the Carnival, a looting, smashing crowd is tearing up Market Street. Windows are crashing from 6th to 3rd Street. The police and shore patrol are unable to and not trying to stop it. There were three hours of looting, vandalism, and rape right here on Market Street. But before dawn, it was over from exhaustion as much as law enforcement. And in the weeks to follow, the trickle of returning servicemen and women became a flood, and then a deluge. More than a million and a half had passed through the Golden Gate on their way to the Pacific, and now most were coming back. The entire Bay Area became a quasi-military base as soldiers, sailors, and airmen arrived in such numbers that no installation could hold them. Camp Stoneman in Pittsburgh was putting up 30,000 troops every night. Fort Mason, Treasure Island, Mare Island, the Oakland Army base, every military facility was swamped. On Angel Island, a big sign had been put up so that the homecoming men could see it, whether they were coming through the Golden Gate by troop transport or flying in over the bridge. Welcome home, well done, it said. It had been put up on Angel Island by Italian prisoners of war. America salutes her heroes back from battlefields of victory. At Hamilton Field, California, wonderful moments for fighting men, liberated after three years in the hell of Jap prisons. San Francisco, where the city's greatest parade in years honors General Jonathan Wainwright. The hero of Bataan and Corregidor comes back after 39 months of torment and brutality in prison camps of the Japanese. San Francisco, here come the B-29s, and its target, Golden Gate, for the superports that helped to smash Japan. 
Now, to every crewman in the first 14 planes to land, there's no sight more worth seeing and patting than California's sunny soil. San Francisco, the giant aircraft carrier Ticonderoga returns. 2,200 Pacific veterans aboard. She's back after one of the worst kamikaze attacks of the war, proudly flying her homeward-bound pennant. For our Navy fighting men back from war, a hero's welcome. The Golden Gate, symbol of America for every Pacific fighting man. And aboard the South Dakota comes the governor of California to welcome Admiral Bull Halsey. And as his fleet comes in, fog makes the ships only a dim outline to thousands lining the harbor's piers and famous bridge. men of war were coming back. The mighty fleet that smashed Japan was home at last. Others were coming back in a much quieter way. They were just as happy to be home, perhaps even more so. Yet for them, the war would never be over. Not quite. Still others would be returning to families held behind barbed wire during the war. Most of the Japanese-American vets had served in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the most honored unit in the Army. They took 10,000 casualties in Italy and France, and between them, won 3,000 Purple Hearts. They were famous for that record, but here's a fact that's seldom mentioned. Another 16,000 Nisei troops served in the South Pacific. Most of them were with military intelligence, intercepting radio messages, translating captured documents, and sometimes working behind the enemy lines. And while those Japanese Americans were risking their lives, the families of most were in relocation camps here in the States. The last evacuees left the camp at Manzanar late in 1945. The Thule Lake Center closed in March of 1946. Few of those who were held in the camps ever returned to their former homes. Some of the returning GIs were bringing new wives with them and others had sent their overseas brides on ahead. I came to stay with my husband's folks, and I know I'm just going to love my mother-in-law, I hope. I don't know what to say. I waited for this for so long, and now we're together. Boy, oh boy, now I know the war's over. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> but most were returning to the girl they left behind. Day would be almost two years in the past when yet another group began coming home. The funeral ship, Honda Knot, arrived in San Francisco with the first 2,028 caskets of war dead being returned from overseas cemeteries. From here, the bodies were taken to trains that would return them to their hometowns. At first, six were taken to City Hall. There they lay in state, representing all of those who gave their lives. And there would be others who never would come home and whose fate remained a mystery. This is an orchestra with two leaders. Its organizer and inspiration, Glenn Miller, who was last reported missing in flight. And the man who is carrying on in the true tradition of an illustrious name, Tex Beneke. After three or four years in Navy, Blue, or in Khaki, both the servicemen and the servicewoman were ready to get into anything as long as it didn't resemble a uniform. And of course, some, like Staff Sergeant Marvin Phillips of Sacramento, could make that transition a bit quicker. He had his own haberdashery, which his wife had been running while he was serving in the 12th Air Force in the Pacific. For men, wild plaids and patterns were in. And for women, it was a return to those nylons that had been rationed all during the war years and then dropping the hemline so that their legs were mostly a memory. The fashion designers called it 
the new look. Meanwhile, the trendsetters were bringing their hair out from under years of defense plant hard hats and kerchief. Of course, some of the new styles became only passing fads. And a lot of the new inventions hardly got off the ground at all, and maybe that was just as well. But we were still filled with a post-war enthusiasm for the brave new world we were pretty sure was just waiting out there for us. We could hardly wait to dive into it. Some successes and some failures as our remembrance of war continues. The newest thing in houses, definitely. It's round, it's built of aluminum and plastics. Instead of a foundation, this cornerless cottage is suspended from a central mast of stainless steel. Using new war-developed lightweight metals and prefabrication by mass production, this home, living room, two bedrooms, two baths, and a kitchen will sell for about $6,500, including a compact heating and air conditioning unit stowed away in the innards with most of the plumbing. A round house may look strange now, but after we get used to them, maybe we'll all be living in better circles. Buckminster Fuller's brainchild wasn't a bad idea, especially the price. But it never caught on, along with lots of other post-war fantasies. A glimpse into the future. Sky buggies for everyone. Not difficult to handle, either. Our pilot had only 14 hours of conventional flying time before becoming a helicopter ace. And experts say piloting can be learned in as short a time as five hours. When the bugs are finally combed out, Helicar will cost no more than a medium-priced automobile. Miracle of today, she's the reality of America's industrial tomorrow. This wasn't the only reality of tomorrow to become a quaint footnote of post-war Americana. Most of us were quite taken by the idea of a flying automobile. This easy-to-operate auto airplane will cost about $3,000. And there were a number of versions and plenty of salesmen willing to peddle you some stock that would get you in on the ground floor of this sure thing. Yes, tomorrow will be wonderful when the family car flies at two miles a minute. Another sure thing, a small-sized automobile. Made to sell at about $500 and to travel at 65 miles an hour, here's a welcome tidbit to car-hungry America. As a matter of fact, the idea did eventually catch on a few years later, but definitely not in this midget month. And who would have guessed in 1946 that when Americans did start getting into small cars, they would be sold to us by our recent enemies, Germany and Japan. And despite all those futuristic predictions, our post-war wheels were completely earthbound and not radically different from what we'd driven in 1941. But wartime technology did bring some changes, or better, or worse. Wartime communications techniques now made it possible for you to have a telephone in your car. At first, there weren't many takers, and skeptics in 1946 said that a car phone would never catch on. The San Francisco Seals had a new transparent backstop, the first anywhere, and apparently the last. It was made of the same kind of safety glass that went into the portholes, battleships, and windshields of combat vehicles. Frozen food already starting out to be used by the airlines, was being touted as the miracle that would free women from the kitchen, while it turned anyone who could heat up an oven into a gourmet chef. RCA was starting to build the first TV sets for consumers, but it would be another three years before Bay Area television stations would put pictures on those little screens. The biggest advance of those post-war years wasn't from technology. It was based on an idea, the GI Bill of Rights. Any veteran with the ability and desire could go to school at government expense. Over two million went to colleges and universities. Others went to trade schools or took on-the-job training. Quonset huts sprung up on every campus in the Bay Area. Khaki pants and old combat jackets became part of the collegiate dress code. For the first time, lots of students were married. Slowly, the Bay Region and the rest of the nation seemed to be returning to normal. Pretty soon it was Shriners, not war heroes, who were parading on Martin Street. Well, some of the old troubles were back, too. 
big telephone strike in San Francisco and a general strike in Oakland. Labor disputes that turned nasty in the streets. In the middle of San Francisco Bay, a huge fire destroyed not only many of the barracks at the Navy Station, but almost all of what remained from the fair on Treasure Island. Had it really been only six years since the fair closed in 1940? Now, that seems so long ago. Another era, another life. And meanwhile, the implements of wartime America were being scrapped or put in storage. Thousands of barges and landing craft were hauled to Golden Gate Fields in Albany, awaiting the scrapping. The Navy shipyard at Mare Island was no longer launching submarines, but putting them in mothballs. And just up the bay, hundreds of Liberty ships and Victory ships were being towed into permanent anchorage. The big coastal defense guns that had made this the Gibraltar of the Pacific were removed and melted down. The emplacements were turned to parkland or let go to weeds, or preserved as historical sites. Old Fort Point under Golden Gate Bridge had housed a battery of searchlights and rapid-firing cannon installations. There was just one wartime casualty here. A soldier was walking across the courtyard when he was knocked flat by a glove dropped by a painter up on the bridge 250 feet above. Well, the Bay Area, like the rest of mainland America, had come through unscathed by enemy attack. And yet, there were occasional reminders of just how lucky we were. On June 10th, 1946, a Japanese torpedo and its lethal warhead washed ashore alongside the Golden Gate Bridge. The Navy determined that it had been fired early in the war and had missed its target. That target, said the experts, was undoubtedly the south pier of the bridge. Now it's been almost a half a century since bombs fell on Pearl Harbor and propelled us into World War II. Today there are more of us who don't have a remembrance of that war than those who do. And there is perhaps some importance in passing on that knowledge. This series has been presented in that spirit. I'm Russ Cogman. Remembrance of War has been brought to you in part by the people of Chevron, by Express Mail Overnight Service, and by Citicorp and Citicorp Safe.